Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Kelly. I'm one of the Vancouver chapter co-chairs for the Women in Leadership organization. And I'm thrilled to have two speakers I've had other events with before here with us tonight, Charmaine and Alain. Can't wait to hear all your insights from surviving to thriving after reorganization. And I can personally kind of uh, speak to this in my own world. I My company went through a larger layoff earlier this year, as many in Vancouver, where I am, have gone through this summer, kind of that uh, COVID bubble burst. And there's definitely been, you know, lots of new bosses, new departments, it can be very stressful for ones there, for ones that have left. Uh, I think it's relevant really in the moment, and I can't wait to dig into it more. If anyone's new to Will, um, please do go over, check out our website, sign up, receive our newsletter if you don't get it already. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at more events. So I am going to now pass it over. We're going to do a quick introduction from our two wonderful speakers. First, I'm going to hand it over to Charmaine to give a little brief introduction. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. I've enjoyed the opportunities to speak to, to this group in past and was excited to be part of tonight. For those of you who I haven't met before, my background actually started out in the jail system. And I always like to tell people that was on the outside of the bars. I was a correctional officer <laughs> for 10 years. But that's where I really became passionate about working with teams because I realized some of the leadership I had and some of the team dynamics that we went through certainly weren't the healthiest. And I had to relearn a lot of skills uh, when I left that system and then opened my business many years later. And so I had a mediation business and specialized in helping teams work through conflict and, and other collaboration challenges. And now as a speaker, trainer, and consultant, that's what I do. I help teams work better together around conflict, relationships, building trust, and healthy cultures. Amazing. And uh, Alain, say hello. Yeah, thanks so much. This is, uh, again, a, a repeat uh, visit for me in this community, and I'm always, it's always a pleasure to be back with you. Uh, so I am a transformational leadership coach and organization development consultant, and I think the way that I boil that down is really about helping individuals, teams, and organizations adapt, grow, and thrive together. My focus um, in my education studies and my experience is always around how do we navigate in complexity and change? And as we all have experienced, you know, the world is just getting more and more complex every day. That's actually just now the new normal. So um, that's that's what I bring to the conversation. And I'm excited to, although it is a very challenging time for many, and it doesn't matter what side of the equation you're on, I myself um, in many decades of my career have been on the reorg layoff side of the equation on all sides of the equation. And um, I've learned a lot through the hard knocks of my experience, as well as through coaching and supporting others through it. So I'm just happy to have the forum tonight to be able to be in conversation with you all. That's amazing. And um, I just wanted to say, we're so thrilled that you're both here. And thank you everybody for attending. I'm Maureen McKinnon. I'm the other Vancouver co-chair for the Women in Leadership. And I will be monitoring the chat for questions because we'll be having a question and answer after the conversation we're about to hear. So I'll pass it back to Kelly. Okay, thank you, Maureen. And I was just gonna add to that, like if you have any questions even before we get started, we are gonna keep it like a little casual. Um, have some dialogue. So please, at any point, yeah, just throw those questions in. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to all of them. Um, absolutely. At any point, do not be shy. And uh, we are in panelist mode. So as you noticed, you're not seeing any of yourselves. But if you do want to speak, just like raise your like, raise hand, and then I can, you know, un unmute you. And please, it does not have to just be the chat. <laughs> you're welcome to join the conversation, if you'd like to. Okay, great. So let's get started. So we're going to start the discussion in kind of the space of meeting the moment, surviving the experience. 
Um, as everyone that's been through a reorg, reorganizations are never pleasant and they never get easier to deal with, no matter what side of the equation you're on. So for those who remain, what are some of the most important things you recommend to help someone to get back on track, reclaim that sense of normalcy after a reorg? Who would like to start? Sherry? Sure. Oh, what a big juicy question that is. Oh, <laughs> change and transition is so difficult for organizations and teams at the best of times. And then when you mix it with a pandemic and all of the complexities that we've all had to go through and leaders having to navigate in spaces that they've never had to do, it's really challenging. I was talking to a client recently in human resources and almost asked a similar question to what you just said, Kelly. And what they shared is they think what's so critical right now is communication. It's so essential because there's so many rumors in organizations when, when people don't know what the status is, uh, we often make up the ending of the story and, and we act on assumptions. We believe our assumptions is, are right. And so I'm really seeing this shift with leaders um, and, and with women in leadership roles taking a very strong focus on almost over communicating is the language they use they said I feel like I'm over communicating but it's being well received and so I would say that is one piece and then finding ways to help the team be resilient together um, change can be exhausting if anyone's ever read William Bridges book um, change and transitions it's a <laughs> I picture the title it's a yellow book and I've read it so many times but I love how he talks about change begins with endings and we have seen so many endings in the last few years and so it's around helping teams uh, navigate and work together in those bumpy spots or what he refers to as the middle zone the old way's not out, the new way's not in, and we're just all trying to be on this tightrope and get to the other side. So I would say that relationship resilience and communication is, is a good place to start. Thanks for that, Charmaine. And um, one of the things I'll just say is, you know, we want to be really intentional tonight in terms of um, offering different perspectives, because, you know, we, we don't know exactly who you are, what brought you to the conversation and where you might be in, in this process. So um, what I'll do is I'll just share from the perspective of, you know, having taken um, a group of clients with an organization through a reorganization recently. And it was one of those sort of two-step uh, reorgs that had a start date and then another date. And so just as people were settling into normalcy, there was another what felt like disruption and an unsettling of, of their new normal. Um, and so the perspective I'll share uh, is from the individual and what it might be like to go through it. And, you know, you sort of touched on uh, Bill Bridges' work around managing transitions. There's also the work that we might be familiar with in other parts of our life around the stages of grief. And that's really what people are encountering. They're encountering, you know, loss and they, there's experience of denial. So if you just think about it, it's like your whole world has been disrupted. And it doesn't matter if, even if you're in a leadership position and you know it's coming, it's never easy. But if you're the person who woke up and either learned that your colleagues were leaving or that this is your last day, um, there is this experience of feeling excommunicated from your people. And for so many of us, it's the people that we most enjoy working with. That's one of the things that creates such a sticky work environment for us. So then to feel like you are cut off from those folks. So it it really does mirror those stages of, agree, of grief, you know, your stage of denial and anger and depression, and it's, it's all there. Um, and so, you know, part of the work is to really just help people come to terms with, first of all, what they're feeling and to be okay with whatever you're feeling. And we may not recognize it, but oftentimes we are actually avoiding the feelings or we're super empathetic and we're taking on everybody else's feelings and then we're not sure what to feel anymore. And it's just, it's a roller coaster ride. And so part of what I would encourage as a place to start 
is to create space for a, a space in a way to allow yourself to process the emotions in a healthy way. And so that might be, you know, paying attention to your environment, surrounding yourself with the things that you know um, are a healthy channel for you, whether that's exercise or getting back into nature, going for a walk. Um, those are things that I like to say, it's like tending to the garden and making sure that you have fertile soil for something new to get created. Um, and then no matter how good you are at that, you're just never sure what you're going to encounter in conversation with the next person. So you may have processed your emotions and you feel like you're a good place. And then you get into a meeting and, you know, the people who are remaining are like, we're not feeling so great about this and off you go. So it really is, uh, two, I have two, two and they go closely together. One is creating a safe and healthy space for you to process your emotions. And then two, and Charmaine touched on this about narrative and the power of narrative and how people will fill in their own narrative if they're not getting clear communication. Well, I like to say our story is our most powerful asset. And so as you tend to emotions, the thing that goes closely with that is our thoughts and I can speak personally to my experience of being laid off in the past. And one of the things that I said to myself, I, I knew instinctively, intuitively that it was the right thing, even though it was painful. And so the commitment I made to myself every day was to get up and to um, really not allow myself the luxury of feeling like a victim about being laid off. And so I tended to my mindset every day. That was my most important thing. And so emotions and thoughts go closely together. And it's the power of learning how to use your story, whether you are the person who's been laid off, whether you are someone who remains after a layoff, to really learn to use the power of story to be able to create a fertile environment for something new to get created and really to be able to surround yourself with a story that is more empowering and that enables you to do the tough work that's going to be in front of you. So there's a lot more I could say about that if I'm going to pause and I'm sure we'll come back to it. No, that's so good. Uh, I know for me personally, one of the things that's helped is I get through change like stages really quickly. I'm very good with change, but remembering to have compassion like you said, when you join something, someone's at a totally different stage than you, it's just to be very mindful that everyone arrives at different times, I find has really helped. And then to Charmaine's point, communication, I feel like our company's done a really good job. Like you can't over communicate in these situations because if someone's like, oh, I don't need it, they just won't read it. <laughs> but for everyone that like, just really wants to know like those town halls, you know, like all hands, like just everything that helps you feel like, okay, I'm informed. I'm, you know, part of the conversation. They're addressing my questions, like nothing's off limits. I find it's helped, right? <laughs> As someone yeah. that, that remains, right? <laughs> yeah. And Kelly, just to say to, to both your point and Charmaine's, there's, there's a sort of uh, a built-in maybe assumption there in communication and there's two sides to communication. Mm -hmm. That's creating the space to listen. Um, and so whether that's at the all hands and the one-on-one -on -one meetings, whatever it is, um, and I know that sometimes that can feel like a tricky spot in leadership, especially if there's more change coming or there's more uncertainty and you can't always be transparent about what's coming, but it can be such a gift to the people who remain and even the people who exit. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we do exit interviews with people who have been laid off, but if you can, if you can have the generosity of just allowing people to be heard and to process their experience out loud, it's such a gift. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add, Charmaine, before we move on to the next topic? Or? No, I, I just think that's so important what you've said. And when you talked about grieving, it, uh, it raised a thought for me that one of the conversations that I've had in some workplaces is that when there has been a reorg or there has been layoffs, sometimes what happens is the individuals that are in the company still, even if their role has changed and their job is no longer the same, sometimes people experience, um, one of the, the people I talked to, she said, it, it feels like survivor guilt. I'm still here and I'm, I'm feeling badly about being here 
because somebody who I care deeply about as a colleague is not. And so it, when you talked about grief, um, I think that's so important. It, it's very complicated. There's a lot of, uh, you know, emotions that we deal with. And, and one of the, the things that I'm loving seeing, there's a lot of leaders that I've talked to lately, and it's been the trends that I've seen is more like the last eight or nine months where there's a lot more emphasis on bringing people together because not every workplace everyone has returned to the work. There's still many scenarios where they are remote or hybrid. And there's been people that have been hired to the team during the pandemic. And so they may not have actually been face to face with people in their team ever. And so there's this trust building that happens. And I'm really seeing a shift, um, which I'm, I'm loving where leaders are making it a priority to bring people together, to encourage those coffee breaks. One of the leaders I work with, her team is all um, remote <clears throat> during the pandemic, and they've remained that way. They've had a couple of reorgs, but she's one of the things that she's, she, she does air quotes. She says, I'm requiring people to actually have coffee breaks together. So every day, I think it's from 10 to 10, 15, there's all these little Zoom calls going on and people are coffee breaking together. And a result of that is that the communication and the team is stronger and more clear, people are feeling connected. And in one of the reports I read early on in the pandemic, there was a report, I think it was University of um, was it U of A, they had done some studies around disasters and they were releasing the results. And when they asked people what helped people get through a disaster or crisis, one of the top few components was connection and connectedness. And so I'm loving when I see leaders working hard at fostering connection because that will help people get through this. No, that's great. Loving it all. Um, so let's take a moment and go to the other side for those who have exited. Um, what about those who have left the organization to survive the experience? I'll, um, I'll touch into some of the, some of the same points. Um, you know, there is the piece around, you know, giving yourself the place, space and time to process the emotions and not just to jump right back in. Uh, but before you can do that, I think you have to address the practical steps first. And sometimes it is to just be able to pause for a moment, especially if you didn't see it coming and um, just to sort of evaluate, okay, financially, where am I today? And if it takes me a minute, if it takes a beat to get into my next opportunity, how long can I sustain myself, my family, our unit? And sometimes it, it's not obvious until you look and you're like, oh gosh, wait a second, I'm, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. So really that's part of the title here is the survival kicks in. You get this amygdala hijack and it, it can send you down the path of like, you just got to go get the next thing. So I encourage people to take the practical step first, just pause, reevaluate. Where are you? You might have to dip into your savings a little bit, but it may not mean that you're going to eradicate your entire savings. Right. And even though we're hearing, you know, I happen to work in the tech sector, even though we're hearing of lots of layoffs, what I've learned from my own experiences over 30 plus years is that there's always companies who have stored, you know, funds away, they've made de decisions differently, and they are ready to snap up talent when those opportunities arise. So there's always opportunity. So first taking care of the practical and really kind of understanding where you are, where you can cut back, you know, how, how long you can sustain yourself. Then allowing the emotions, the process, and it's not going to feel linear. It's not going to feel like a step-by-step -step guide. It's going to happen how it happens, but, you know, just... If you have that clarity of mind and you can, these are some, some ways to move through it. Then coming back to power of story, um, you know, we treat our thoughts. I see this over and over again in my, in my coaching. We treat thoughts like they're concrete, like they are real things, like this is the reality today. And what I encourage people to do is to kind of move from a continuum of thinking of your thoughts as concrete or treating them as concrete. Uh, being able to experience them like clouds, I have a thought, maybe my thought is, oh my gosh, I'm catastrophizing, you know, I'm not going to get the next thing, this is going to look bad on my resume, this is personal, you know, why did I get laid off versus someone else? Um, so if you can start to treat your thoughts like clouds, 
meaning they're there, they're, you know, the blue sky is above the clouds. We know that. And we can sort of, the thoughts can come because we're not going to control them. We're not going to stop them from coming. The thoughts can come, but we can allow them to kind of keep moving. And it doesn't mean we have to act on them. And then the final part of the continuum is treating our thoughts like clay. <laughs> like we really actually have the power to use our thoughts to create something new. And that's a process. And as you're going through the stages of grief, when you're in the early stages of grief, you're not getting to the thoughts like clay. It's just, it's just not there at that moment. Um, but what I encourage people to do is um, take time as you can to reflect on your experience. I call it like the virtual exit interview. And, you know, when we are in that amygdala hijack, that survival response, we tend to focus on all the failures, the things that went wrong how this is going to impact us and what it means about us personally. We're constantly making meaning. And so if you can try to get some objectivity, stand on the balcony and be able to say, you know what, what, what am I really proud of, of my time with Organization X? What were some of the areas and times and places where I really stretched outside my comfort zone? And yeah, I might've fallen on my face, but what did I learn in the process? Or what came out of it that just was beyond what I'd ever accomplished before? So I encourage you to allow the emotions and then take that time to really own, I call it, you got to know your story and you got to own your story. That's where your power is. And as you practice doing that, you'll be able to take even the most challenging career experiences and be able to talk about them in a next interview in a way that really demonstrates who you are. And it doesn't have to be a negative. Beautifully stated. Wow. <laughs> I, you got me thinking with your answer too, that, um, with, I love what you said about the power of thoughts because boy, oh boy, can they get us in trouble sometimes when we think our thoughts are real? Uh, I mean, they are real, they're happening, but if we think the thoughts are the truth or yeah. the actual scenario and we act on them, sometimes what we're having to do now is clean up other little messes that get mm -hmm. created because we acted on this thought or assumption that wasn't accurate. So I really was thinking about that. And one of my clients said to me um, that she found in the change process in her organization, the most frustrating thing for her um, prior to her leaving the organization was that everybody focused on everything that is changing. This is changing. This will be different. We're not doing it this way anymore. And she said it felt emotionally exhausting. And she didn't realize how exhausting that was until she was no longer there. But she was finding that her thoughts were always taking her down kind of this um, panic mode, almost like everything's going wrong. She was continuing those thoughts. And then one day she said, I just want to know what's not changing. My family structure is not changing. Where I live is not changing. You know, my relationships are not changing. And she started to identify everything that wasn't changing. And her words to me was that all of a sudden she felt empowered. She felt mm. revitalized. And I just thought that was great feedback that when we're getting caught up in that sort of moving snowball where things almost feel overwhelming, because if we aren't with the organization, it often feels overwhelming. We're managing all that you just talked about. We're managing our fear of finances. What am I going to do? What if I can't find another position? What if I don't get a team as great as the one I was with? And another client said to me, this became her opportunity. She kind of said to herself, what do I want to do now? You know, that her words were now that I'm grown up and I'm experienced, what do I want to do now? And mm -hmm. she discovered that because she was in this position of needing to look at that, that she was able to identify maybe where she was working, the sector that she's worked in for many, many years isn't where she wants to be now. It, where she, it was where she was, but maybe there was a new opportunity. Now you can imagine that took a lot of thought, pro change, thought pro process changing, but it's allowing her no, now to hone up on some new skills, acknowledge skills that she forgot she had and look for opportunities that she probably would never have pursued if she were still in the same um, organization. So it, it's really, I'm seeing people kind of um, navigate this and manage it in many, many different ways. Um, the last piece I'll say is that um, in conversation with someone who's no longer with the organization, uh, she identified for me 
that how important relationships are. And she said, I found myself going through my LinkedIn and my kind of my cell phone to look at who I knew. And she said, the, there were people that I'm connected to that have opportunities. But be, when I was employed by the employer, I was never looking at them in that way. And so she started to see that some of the relationships she'd worked so hard to develop and foster over the years, perhaps would be now the people that are helping her find new opportunities in her new path. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Alan, did you have some dad or? Well, I, I was pausing to see yeah. if you or more you wanted to get in there, but just to say that, you know, um, I do a lot of work in my coaching around something called the drama triangle, where we end up in these roles of victim, villain, and hero. And, and that can happen every day, all day long, just for regular dynamics in our career and our life and our families. Uh, but even more so when you go through an event like this. And really what's at the center of it is how we end up in that dynamic is a, an experience or a perception of loss of power and loss of connection. And so you can imagine how that comes into play when I'm the person who's been laid off. I, I lost, definitely feel a loss of power because I had no choice in the matter you know, I'm on the outs. Maybe I thought I was really contributing and adding value. Maybe I was getting good feedback up until six weeks ago. And now here I am on the outs. And then that loss of connection and feeling like I, you know, I can't be with my people in the same way. And so, you know, you touched on something really important. And, you know, I talk about using narrative and story to reclaim our power and then to get back into connection and to um to not let the isolation take over because we can start to feel even though we are not alone in it we can start to feel like there's something unique to us in the, in the challenge that we're experiencing and so to be connected not only to share with each other in our experience but to get connected and to have that you can start to see and Maureen I think you were sharing about just watching what's happening in the industry where a lot of people you just see these organic uprising of people sort of a grassroots movement of people reaching out and like wrapping their arm their digital arms around each other to help people get connected to new opportunities so really loving to see that yes maureen and i talked about that a lot after the summer like rash of layoffs in vancouver just how inspiring it was to see all these organizations collaborating together with like here's our list of talent like please somebody like hire them and just like to see them come together it's not a competition it's like these very talented people are all available for jobs I'll connect you I don't even know you and I'll connect you right yeah. Like, yeah. and uh, you don't see that often on LinkedIn so it was um, quite nice it really was I think the other thing that people need to realize too is that when you tell someone in the next in interview that you were made redundant that is a purpose an acceptable reason why you're looking for a job. It, it reflects on the fact that even though you know you were, your department was made redundant or whatever, personally, that's really still hard to separate my personal work and ethics. The company wasn't valued. That's not true, actually. It's some kind of a business decision, which is logical up here and financial, usually to the companies that reflects on what they call full-time employees and the head count is the way that the accountants and people talk about it and to them they're just they're deleting or eliminating or reducing their cost for the uh, full head counts and all the rest of that sort of stuff so even though I understand that it's hard to understand that it had absolutely nothing to do with you and your work ability and performance which you get to take with you plus all of your accomplishments uh, and it's perf it's really acceptable. People don't ask anymore, why are you looking for a job? Almost, because there's just so much change going on. It doesn't matter. It matters is what can you bring to us? And do you want to work with us? And how can we make it you come on board with us kind of idea? Yeah. So um, I think people should take that away too, that it's okay to be laid off or let go, especially in this climate, because it's happened to so many people. It's yeah. just a non-starter almost. I mean, you don't even get asked that question sometimes in interviews anymore. Yeah. <laughs> especially if, they, if they're looking to acquire the talent, they just wanna know, are you available? Can you start, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is great. 
Yes, such a good point. Okay, so to wrap up this section, um, for those that are leading others, what can leaders do before and during to ease the experience for those laid off and for those who remain? That's such a great question. I think it's so important how we frame that news to individuals because how we communicate that is, um, is so important. I've seen a lot of leaders lose sleep over, you know, how do I say this and how do I, um, how do I share this change and news in a way that people's esteem is not damaged and where people can understand the decision. Um, I'm seeing leaders, some leaders getting coaching on that, whether it's internal in the organization or with a coach like Ilan, being able to actually get coaching. Because for many leaders, this may have been the first time as well that they've had to do this. And then of course, um, you know, really, uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing a, a, a bit of a, I don't know if it's a trend or I'm just noticing it more, but there's an emphasis with many organizations where there's been reorgs or layoffs and significant changes where leaders are helping pull the team together because anytime there's a change in an employee, um, even pre-COVID, if somebody would leave, the dynamics in the team are likely to change. And when we see a lot of people leaving at once, the dynamics in the team change significantly. And what I feel is really helpful is those leaders who are noticing that and helping the, the team cope and change and bringing the team together. Um, some leaders are actually holding team connections or meetings more frequently to help the team feel connected, be updated. But I think it's really important that leaders make themselves available for questions and sort of know that the team can come and ask questions and share how they're coping as well, because it really going to use you, the word you used earlier, Alain, which was disrupt, like it disrupts the team. And um, we need to take care of that as well. Yeah. yeah. And I know, Charmaine, you also covered this a little bit earlier, too, in terms of communication and that transparency. Um, the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, you hear a lot about this sort of uh, emotional exhaustion that um, not only, you know, everyone who remains might feel it, but certainly leaders might feel it to an nth degree. They're having all of those one-on-ones, they're hearing it from the people above them and below them. And there's that, you know, it, depending on where you are, right? But often it's the, the middle managers who most feel that emotional exhaustion. So it's kind of like when you're in a plane, you put your own oxygen mask on first, otherwise you're just not available to really be able to show up for others. Um, and that can only exacerbate the situation. You know, it, it's a different situation. It wasn't a layoff situation, but I was in a director role. I had people sort of on the front lines who were maybe, you know, not, they were either, I, was called, I called it the three Bs, either burning out, uh, bored or breaking down, right? Like just something was kind of off in the dynamic and we're trying to manage capacity. And then, you know, that kind of went on for a prolonged period of time and we're trying to solve the turnover issue. And the implications of that was it started to then impact the management level. Because look, I'm trying to hire good people. I want great, great talent so that we can go do our best work. But I feel like I'm always resetting to the beginning to hire more people. So just as an example, we really think about how middle managers um, end up dealing with um change. And if we are not taken care of, and if we're not taking care of our leaders that are in the middle, um, which quite frankly, I think are often the place where the change actually happens. That's usually where the trust is, the most established trust is. And if a layoff happens, oftentimes trust is shaken uh, at the executive level. And there feels like there's a breakdown of trust, or maybe there's, you know, some sort of re-examining of relationships, but those relationships with your manager are often the things that feel the most solid. And so if our managers don't feel enabled and empowered and supported to take care of themselves first, 
then, you know, the, it, the situation can only get worse. So I encourage you to some of the things I talked about earlier in terms of, you know, having that healthy space, um, you know, carving out space and place for getting your own clarity um, so that you, what can I say? When can I communicate? You know, what kinds of conversations can I be hosting? Um, and, and the other thing is being as transparent as you can about this is a conversation that we can have and I can sort of approach this from a consultative place where I'm open to your feedback. I want to hear about the implications. As we know, going through a reorg, usually what it means is the people who remain are expected to do more with less. It's the bottom line, <laughs> or I should say the headline of every reorg. That's what it boils down to. And so how are we actually going to get stuff done? And then what is within our decision-making power? What are some things that we can just run, run with? And what are some things that your manager can consult with your people on and take that feedback in as part of the decision-making process? And then what are other things that are just clear directives that this is the way it is and we've got to figure out how to implement and keep moving? So those are some ways that I think also being transparent, but taking that time and space for yourself and modeling, if you can, that work-life balance, shutting off at the end of the day, and then, you know, being as clear as you can about what's possible in terms of moving forward communication and decision-making. Yeah. yeah that, that, I love what you've said about the self-care for leaders, because often they too are take, doing more with less and self-care, uh, you know, people watch to see what, how their leaders are coping. And so we often see leaders say things like, your wellness is most important. It's really important to take self-care. Yet the employees are getting emails from their leader at 2.30 in the morning. And so there's a disconnect. And I hear you saying that, yet I'm not seeing you show that. So this is a great opportunity I, um, for leaders to demonstrate what wellness and resilience and thriving looks like and, and coping with tough stuff looks like in action. And, and when we don't do that, we almost create, um, I love uh, Patrick Lencioni's words, he calls it superficial harmony. So mm -hmm. we end up with this environment that on the surface looks like we're all doing good. Everyone's playing nicely in the sandbox and, it, and it's not that way at all. We're kind of all walking on eggshells um, in this environment that feels superficial. And that can become very problematic later, but it also doesn't support that resilience that Ilan was talking about being so important, our self-care. Hmm. Yes, I find that interesting, just uh, in, in the middle still, <laughs> adjusting to after. So do, do more with less concept. And, you know, we were told very strongly, like, you know, no heroic measures, you know, um, some things are just not going to get done anymore and that's fine like we're just going to have to focus on the important things but watching that you know my leaders were following the same was definitely like forging kind of that path mm -hmm. right as long as they were on the same it's like okay then you know we're all okay right because yeah, yeah if you see them you know doing all the heroic measures you think Oh, they're just kidding. Like, yeah. <laughs> you expect me to do that as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I personally, I feel that it, you know, it kind of seeps through. Yeah. Well, to Charmaine's point about how important communication is, and so much of communication is nonverbal. <laughs> so, right. We actually pay more attention to the nonverbal communication and those cues than even what you say. So, yeah, it was a good time for some alignment for sure. Um, just take a quick pause if there's any burning questions before we move on to kind of like the, the next part, uh, showing up in the new normal. We will have lots of time for questions after, but just in case someone like really had something. Um, key of start. Um, I do have one here. Uh, how do I start looking for new opportunities, especially if I haven't had to do this in some time, like been, mm -hmm. been out of the looking job force, I think for a while. Who wants to start with that one? I'll be brief, Charmaine. Um, I, I always encourage people to start from 
it start from the inside out. You know, I, I talk a lot about the Pareto principle in my work and, you know, this 80-20 rule that 20% of our effort gets us 80% of our results. Question is, which 20%? <laughs> so from my view, the 20% to focus is always the internal because <laughs> it can be very easy to get caught up in what do the job postings say and what are they what are they looking for? And, you know, how do I fit myself to match that box and check those boxes? Um, and that can be exhausting as well, especially having gone through this identity shaking, confidence shaking experience of being laid off. And so I encourage you to take a pause, check in on what your values are, what your strengths are, what are the things that actually really light you up? And Charmaine, you know, I know you gave an example of a client who was on the other side going, wait, wait a second, this is like opportunity. And I know you don't get there immediately, but I encourage you to build a strong foundation. It's sort of like you, you haven't been to the gym in a while and you go to work out and you realize, oh, I need my core for everything, for my back bends to my lunges. And my core feels really weak. So what I equate as your core is knowing your strengths, your values, and most importantly, connecting. How do I show up? What are my contributions and the roles? And it's not so much about your title, but the roles that I've been in, what are the contributions that I've made? And what is the value of that, those contributions short-term? And what is the long-term impact of that? And it's almost like starting to think of yourself and your career the way an investor would. This is an asset and you are looking, where are you going to invest that asset with this next organization? And so you want to make sure that you're lining up with something that's really going to feel fulfilling and like an opening and a greater expression of who you are in the world. So if you can, you know, just sort of set aside the, if you're feeling any kind of panic, set that aside for a moment do that inner work first to really get that strong core foundation underneath you and then start to evaluate job opportunities from that perspective and also go into the interview process from the perspective, I'm sure you've heard this before, but to really take it on that you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you and pay attention to who are you being interviewed by? Who's in the room? Who's not in the room? You know, are you only kind of hearing the, the sort of the hierarchical line and meeting with those folks? Or are you meeting with a broad range of folks from different parts of the organization? And are you getting to have opportunity to ask really authentic, open questions? Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And I, th I think too, there's opportunity for networking. Sometimes when we're busy head down in our, our um, in our job, in our role, we attend a lot of meetings, but they're not always networking meetings where we can get together with colleagues and other professionals, other leaders like tonight, this group, um, and, and having those conversations and letting people know that you are out there seeking new opportunities and communicate what type of opportunities you're looking for because I've seen so many people when like people want to help I, I've just seen this over and over again in my own life in my client's life and I've also been reminded many times in my own life that um, you know people want to help and if they don't know how to help then then they might not and so when we can voice to people that we trust or know or connected to we're in a networking circle that we're looking for opportunities and what type of opportunities we never know who other people know and often those opportunities come to us before they're even put out there in the world because it's coming from someone that that individual knows and trusts and have a relationship with so there the networking might be a way that people find opportunities um i love what elan said about uh, you know you're interviewing them too so choose those organizations who and companies whose values and culture is aligned with the type of environment that you want to work in. Some people go get a coach. Um, I've seen clients where they go and connect with a career planning professional or a coach to help them identify um, maybe the sector that they want to work in, the type of industry that they want to work in. And then it, what I think would happen is that it doesn't feel like we're just grasping at any opportunity that's being presented to us. Um, and, and I think the other piece that I would say is um, to 
to set some time aside to do this um, where it doesn't feel like we're doing this at 11 o'clock at night before bed, for example, because then we're not getting a good sleep. But if you can take time, measured time or plan time to be able to pursue opportunities, then it feels more like a planning process than it does responding to a crisis, if that makes sense. It, there's a different feeling to it. And it feel, I'm going to go back to what something that you said earlier, where you feel like you're regaining some of that control over yeah. your life and your situation. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on. So now the initial shock has worn off. That inevitable settling period that happens as folks come to grips with the new normal. So how do you navigate through uncertainty and change without losing yourself or losing your way? Um, for those that remain, now what? My career may no longer seem realistic in this situation, the plans I'd made. Uh, will there still be opportunities to grow within the company? Like I'd set out this really nice growth path. Is it still there? Does that role still exist? How do I build relationships with new leaders? Um, I may have not worked with these teams before. They're new to me. Uh, maybe it's an entirely different team. Lots to unpack here. Who <laughs> would like to start? Shamari, Charmaine, do you want to start? Okay, hey, you're right. There is lots to unpack there. Wow. So after that initial shock is over and we're, we're kind of getting our footing. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the questions that you identify, Kelly, pop up for us. Um, many times if we are in, you know, we, we are now introduced to a new team, a new organization. So we're coming into that group needing to build trust build relationships. And it's important to recognize that we need the time and the space to do that. Um, and and it, can, it can be a challenge. Like I, I think about one of the hardest positions of um, for leaders, whenever I talk to leaders about the toughest time that they've made a transition, they'll often say from, you know, that one transition of going from being in the team to now leading the team is a super challenging position, but also being in the organization and going into a new team can also be a really a challenging um, dynamic because we know people differently than, you know, sort of now how we're working with them. So I would say take time to build the relationships, to build the trust. Um, when we start asking ourselves, you know, what does my career path look like? Am I going to be able to still pursue the path that I, the Kelly, you asked something to that effect. These are great conversations for those supervision meetings that you might have with your leader. Like I love it when people bring these questions up, because again, when a leader understands what your long-term goals are, not just your interim goals, but your long-term goals. Um, and if it is to hopefully grow with that company, then they can help support you. So, and sometimes when we fear that maybe, you know, we'll, we'll go through another reorg, or I fear that I could lose this job, then we tend to, to shy away from that conversation. But I think it is important to let people know what our goals are, because there's so much opportunity for mentoring right now. Kelly, you really nailed it when you said doing more with less. And I'm seeing one of the really neat opportunities. This came to me a few years ago from a colleague who had, I think, 27 years, um, in government and was going to be um, the, the whole department actually was going to uh, be reorganized and there were six of them that wouldn't have their job anymore. And my colleague kept saying like, I've got 20, you know, 20 plus years experience. Could I share this experience? Could I pass forward this knowledge? Like, how can I give you 26 years or whatever it was on a silver platter to help you? And I was so sad to hear that they didn't pursue that opportunity, allowing this person to mentor others before they exited. Because when that individual exited, all that 26 years of knowledge and celebrations and really cool things that have happened were, were gone with the person. And so I'm loving it when I see leaders and employees like looking for mentoring opportunities in the workplace. We're seeing this more and more with employee resource groups 
um, becoming highly recognized and where there is time and energy put forth to them. And that makes me, I feel joy when I see that because I think that's another way that people can connect and also be looking forward in their own career path and, and the goals that they hope to accomplish as a professional and in that company. Yeah, so so beautifully said, Charmaine. Um, the other thing that I encourage people to do is to really have, again, a sense of ownership around your career path. And uh, one of the things I always say is like, I'm not about circumstances. Now, it's easier said than done. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm I'm helping people create a career in life they love. And you're not going to do that if it's based on circumstances, because life is going to keep lifing. Life is just doing what life does. And, you know, no matter how well we plan, or even if you like to have control, you know how exhausting it is to try to control things, especially that, you know, 90% of it is out of our control. And we learned that through the pandemic. We really got that if we didn't, if we hadn't gotten it before. So, um, one of those pieces is around, you know, really having ownership of your career path, your career development plan. Sometimes that means you're the one that has to retell your story to a new manager to the organization who wasn't there, or now you're on your second or third manager and you haven't advanced, but you've got a lot of work behind you. And now you need to advocate for yourself and your progression and your advancement with someone who's new to the organization or new to the team. So I think it's important that we come to that with a sense of ownership rather than feeling that like that is owned by our manager or by the organization. That's really something that I think we should each have in our in our back pocket. The other thing I would say, you know, you touched on Charmaine, how fear can can set in. And if we're not paying attention, fear can become the driver and the motivator if it wasn't already having gone through an event that feels traumatic, it can then going forward, we, we still look like the same person to everybody else, but now our motivation has shifted from ambition and drive and vision and purpose to fear. Like, how do I avoid, you know, another potential catastrophe or how do I protect what I have? How do I control for certain circumstances? And so, you know, I encourage you to do the work. I talk a lot about showing up fully. And for me, that is like, what is my highest and best expression? Where am I at right now? I got a collection of skills, some unique strengths, talents, superpowers, like what's my highest and best expression right now? And so one of the things that I encourage people to do is to be at choice. Instead of feeling like, you know what, someone else made the decision and I'm one of the lucky ones and I'm still here. Let me just wait and see what happens, which is a very much inside that sort of fear bubble. And I get it. It's a self-preservation mechanism. But if you can move yourself through that and come from a place of, can I, you know, what would it look like in this environment for me to show up at my highest and best? And for some people in that more with less environment, they're like, actually, let me roll up my sleeves <laughs> and, you know, get to work on some things. Now, here's the thing. You may not feel like you have permission, but there's a lot of times when you don't need permission. You don't need the position. You don't need the title. You don't need permission. Yes, I'm not talking about, you know, taking on a voluntary next role off the side of your desk and doing it for free. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about like, what does this environment call for? And is this where I still want to be? And if so, how do I find those opportunities to show up at my highest and best? And instead of then handing it over, or expecting your manager to be the one going, wow, you really came through in a crunch. I saw how you really showed up. Um, th that's nice to have, and you might get that, but you might not because you, everybody's just stretched. So be willing to do that for yourself. You know what? what? Here's what I learned about myself in a crisis. I really roll up my sleeves. I'm looking out for other people. I figure out really quickly critical thinking, what's most important. I can quickly help people reprioritize. Now go look at your resume. Does it say any of that on your resume? Maybe not. Maybe now is a perfect opportunity for you to add that 
and be able to tell the story of, you know what, this is something I learned that I might not have learned about myself without having gone through this challenging experience. Yeah, I love that. Like, you know, get a new manager, you think, oh, they'll just know what I did before. And uh, they may not. And it's okay to like, take your book of wins and strengths. And, you know, here it is. <laughs> it's okay, I feel like to self advocate. Absolutely. Lead with your strengths. I love it. Um, now, and, we- and I talk to my clients often, well, to all of them, about having their success journals is what I call, which is the actual documentation of all these things that you've achieved, um, including things like emails from clients saying what a great job you did and all of those sorts of things. Because especially as women, we too often dismiss them. We don't actually recognize that this actually is a compliment. If somebody is recognizing a skill set or something that you've done that they appreciate it, which means other people probably appreciate it too. So it is actually a skill set or an achievement that you should let other people know about, but you have to document it. You have to keep all of this information someplace so that you do have it documented because life moves so fast. If you don't do it on a regular basis, you will forget it. You will, it'll be gone. And um, so, and then you feel much more confident when you're talking to your new manager because you know you've done all this stuff before. You know that they might not know. So it's an easy transition because you're just telling them what you've done. You're not bragging, you're not exaggerating. You're just saying, this is what I've done for this company or in the last six months or year or whatever time frame you want. So it's a very solid tool for people to have. And it really helps your self-confidence when you get to sit back uh, with a cup of coffee or glass of wine and read it for yourself. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and realize, hey, I did all of these things, yes, right? which yes. means I can do more. I have figured all this stuff out now. I know I can do more, right? Yeah. I love that you said writing that down too, because we often, you know, try and hold everything in our, our head. And then as you said earlier, our thoughts on travel is accurate. I just recently moved across the country and in the packing process, it warmed my heart that so I as I'm going through my file cabinets I had a whole half drawer of all these things that I have even forgotten that I have collected like a thank you card from someone 27 years ago and I can't even tell you it took me hours to pack that little section of because I had to read everything and I thought oh this is I need to keep this closer to where I work every day because how fun it was was to just you know whip another one out of that file and and remember things that I had forgotten and and also to see kind of the the journey um happening and I had a whole bunch of stuff from you know when I worked in the young offender system in the 80s that I had written down as I was in my very first job learning thinking I could save the world and found out very quickly I couldn't. So I really love what you said, Maureen, about writing things down, printing things. And when we're having a day that is a tough day, take those out. You know, these are kind of your moments of things that you experience, your growth, your contributions to your team and your colleagues and your friends and family, and let those guide you sometimes when you're having a tough day. Yes, all of that and more. (laughs) And more. Yes, I love it. Um, so continuing on, um, for those who have exited, uh, which can for some feel like a serious setback to keep moving forward in their career. And then for ones in your team that have had to exit, you know, how do you navigate losing a valued member of your team? You know, those feelings of grief we we talked about earlier are like directly associated to your daily, like. When you go to, oh, just ask no, you know, when they don't show up to the first team meeting, right? Those feelings. I think the other thing too is I've heard people telling me in these reorganizations that all of a sudden the managers aren't stepping up. Like we don't know who's supposed to be doing that job because that person left, Uh, but nobody's told us who's taken over. Right. So do we wait until it affects our job before we start doing it? Right. Because 
it has to get done because otherwise I can't do what I need to do. So does that mean I have to do it? And that's the doing more, but without the direction, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. um, a pro can be a problem that some of these people are going through also because they're not sure where their job is anymore, what they're supposed to be doing actually, and how much they're supposed to be doing because it hasn't been made clear to them, communicated, I guess. Yes. Or yeah, it's expanding. Right. You that's a really good point, Maureen, that you raise. I, I had a conversation with a client not long ago and she said, My biggest growth has been learning to ask good questions. And I said, where does that come from? And she said, not getting good answers. And so I thought that, <laughs> so uh, the learning for her was if I want good answers, sometimes I have to ask questions. And often we don't ask questions. We don't want to appear that we don't know something or we go through that. What will people think if I ask that question? Or what if I can't handle their response? Um, with this doing more with less, what we are seeing a lot of, and I have these conversations all the time with clients where one person is asking, can you do this? And another person comes and adds something else to the to-do list. And all of a sudden, an individual is feeling very overwhelmed and becoming very clear very quickly that they can't possibly accomplish all that has now been put on their plate. Yet if people don't know that, they will still keep putting things on the plate because they haven't heard that the plate is full yet. And so boundary setting, uh, which is uncomfortable for so many of us, um, boundary setting becomes very important of how, uh, around how we cope and navigate this, being able to communicate, ask great questions and help people help you set boundaries. And when I think we this here, we're thinking, I don't want to set a boundary because what if I'm next, right? Like that thought would go through my head even. So it's a delicate dance on this one. Sorry, Lana. I cut no, you off. no, that was, I, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you got a chance to finish there because you're right. It is, it's not, it's not easy answers. You know, you, we, we can have that internal conflict about how is this going to be perceived and so on. Um, one of the things, and this isn't easy necessarily to implement after a reorg. It's something that I encourage organizations to do from the get-go, like whenever it is that you're thinking about, you know, as Charmaine says, how to get people working better together. I talk about people adapt, adapting, growing, and thriving together. And because, you know, my focus is always on complexity and systems of complexity, which we are as human beings and our organizations are, uh, is how do we move decision making and even the grappling together how do we move that to the team level instead of the traditional sort of hierarchical we look up to the answers and then they trickle down and so on and i think more and more the the i mean if you just look at the amount of companies that are having to reorganize we had a plan this is what we thought we were going to do from a sales perspective this is what we forecast and now whoop we got to like readjust and and it's not often only just once over a period of years, it can happen several times. So I'm always an advocate for like putting the tools in the hands of the folks who are doing the work to be able to navigate through complexity and make sense of it and make good decisions and figure out how to collaborate. We throw that word around all the time, like collaboration. And what does that really mean? And then what does it look like? Not just collaborating as a team, but collaborating across the organization and if you talk to a lot of people, they still have this experience of being siloed in their departments and siloed in the decision making. So I offer up tools like um, there's a guy, Barry Johnson, who's created great work around polarities management. And it's like, how do you get people in a room? And often we come with this problem solving mentality. It's either this or that. And, you know, he just came out with another uh, a, a new book recently called And. Like, <laughs> you know, yes, and uh, is something that comes from improv. Polarities is about seeing two sides of an equation where both of them are necessary as part of the solution. And oftentimes it's, we go one or the other. And, and even as leaders, we'll take us down a path. This is our strategy. And we focus on one approach to solve the problem or to get us where we're going. Meanwhile, we're creating another set of problems because we don't just need that side, that approach, we need its counterbalance. So to give an example, so it's not so conceptual, it's like talking about silos. 
It's important to have autonomous business units in an organization that can be sort of light and agile and make decisions and not be dependent on all of the other parts of the organization. But if that goes too far, and if everybody's working autonomously, then we get, you know, folks who don't know what's going on, we get lack of communication, you know, so the other side, being able to be interdependent and cross-pollinate and connect with each other, that's also important. And so a tool like Polarities Management is a way of helping, and it's not just for managers, it's bring those tools to your team so that they can start to be part of the grappling with you know what, there's only so much room on the plate. And if you want to put more things on the plate, something's got to come off. Let's grapple with the trade-offs, <laughs> right? So um, I think it's important. I think the bottom line is, and it's always been part of my focus on self-leadership, is that, you know, everybody needs to know how to lead, even if you don't have the authority, the position, the title. And so how do we enable that? And I know empower is sort of an, you know, it can be controversial as a term, but how do you enable folks to feel like they get to be part of it and that they can grapple with some of those tough decisions to get things done and to not be doing it at the expense of their own well-being, their own health, their own self-care? No, that's so great. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to move on to kind of like our final section just so we can leave um, a few minutes for questions. So we're going to end with creating your thriving future, obviously. So was your career interrupted? Um, so can you give us some examples of how people you've worked with have used their experiences of either being laid off, let go, or remaining in a reorg to write their next chapter and to create a more fulfilling career experience. So some of those like next chapter inspiring stories, no pressure, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> if you wanna start a lot. Uh, go ahead, Charmaine. So, hmm. you know, I some of the next chapters I've seen um, aren't necessarily related to a career change, but they are. So what I mean by that is some of the next chapters that have been written from people I've talked to aren't necessarily the next job they went into. I'm seeing people talk about, you know, I, this became the, the reason I started going to the gym, or this became the reason that I pursued a hobby that I love, that gives me joy, that I've put on hold for 20 years, and I've gotten reconnected with it. So this was this has been very interesting for me in some conversations because not all next chapters are about the next job. Sometimes it's about how we learn and grow in the process of moving to that next employment or business opportunity. Um, I've seen people that have kind of reconnected with people that they'd sort of lost touch with. Um, I've actually seen some people become entrepreneurial and so I've had conversations with people that um, one person who had worked for with government her entire career and found that she has some exceptional skills that she's finally seen about herself. I don't think it was a surprise to anyone else, but she was the last to kind of know that she had these strengths and she became entrepreneurial. She thought, I wonder if I could do this for other people or other businesses. So I've seen that. So where the next chapter has not become a job it's become their own business or self-employment. Um, I've seen next chapters look like, maybe I'm gonna take some time, you know, if our family can handle financially and I'm, and I'm just gonna spend some time on me. And I've seen that happen or spend time with my family. And so I'm seeing, I don't know about you, but seeing lots of next chapters and some are that some next chapters are, I need to be working and I need to be working now and this is the position I'm going to take and it isn't my dream job, but I've come to terms with the fact that this helps me solve the issues that I need to take care of right now for me and my family. And I know that I can still pursue the dream job later. So I think there's a real, maybe a range of what those next chapters look like, at least from people that I've been speaking to. 
Yeah, I think there's also something to be said for the, you know, the wave of reorganizations that are happening now on the heels of what happened during the pandemic, because a year ago we were talking about the great resignation. <laughs> so I think there's some people who are still in that place of having done some deeper soul searching about what's important to them, what their values are. Uh, some people who have now gone remote. I happen to work with organizations. I was remote for a long time before the pandemic happened. But uh, some people who now had the opportunity to work remotely might have been affected now by the layoffs, but are like, you know what, I'm not going back. That actually now is in my top five values list that it's important to me to be able to work remotely. Or I think, Charmaine, you mentioned the other day, the flip side, people are like, no, mm, done with working at home. I need to be in the office. I need to be social. I need to be in person with other folks. And so, you know, even though it can feel like a real, as I said earlier, identity shaking, confidence shaking uh, experience if we can sort of slow the pace down a little bit and, and be able to look for and what I call play in possibilities, what does this open? And for me, my personal experience, um, I was talking with a coachee the other day and it was the first time I ever kind of broke down my own story. And I'm like, oh God, it took me 10 years to fully transition to the work I most love. And I kept thinking, I'm ready. And then I would take two steps forward, oh, you know, and I'd get scared and I'd take three steps back. Uh, but the final step was being laid off from my dream job and having a beautiful conversation with the CEO. It was like, I'm not doing the traditional exit interview. I'm doing the exit interview the way I want to do it. So I'm not going to hash over what was wrong or what didn't go well or I'm just going to talk about the moments I'm proudest of, the things that I accomplished, the things that I see for myself that I wish I could have brought more of, that I'm adding to my list of things of, of how do I shine in the world. But ultimately what it did was I gave myself permission to throw my hat over the wall once and for all. Like now's your time, girl, go do the thing that you're here to do, the thing that you cannot not do. And that was, you know, the final catalyst of a 10-year journey to doing what I'm doing today. And that did come through what could have been perceived as a traumatic experience. So again, that's why I just encourage that even though it might feel dire in the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create that space because sometimes those challenges are really a messenger for us of something else that is there. The spark is already within us and we just need to kind of connect and get that lined up. And then new opportunities might show up that we might not even have seen had we not taken the time to sort of understand ourselves and where we're at in this moment. And I think the other thing too, is that for people who are staying, they're is opportunity that will show up in the short term and medium term as they reorganize themselves. And they will be looking for people who are willing to say, yes, let me do this, let me do that. Or in Kelly's case, I know they've come to her and asked her to take on several different roles, which she doesn't wanna do. <laughs> Someone needs to do it so that opportunity exists there. It just doesn't fit what Kelly wants to do right now and her skill set. Um, so that means that there's an opportunity for someone else in that company who stayed to take on that role. Yeah. And I will say the thing I, I encourage uh, some of my clients to do as well is, look, we forget that org structures are made up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. We hire consultants and we pay them well and we, you know, they bring in their expertise. Uh, you know, I participate in that kind of work myself, but it's one, it's a snapshot in time of what we think will work to align strategy and people and help us get to where we're going, but it's made up. So what I've encouraged some folks to do on the remain side is now there, you might be seeing gaps and don't expect that because you're not in the leadership role or in the top leadership role, that that's somebody else's job. I'm just going to wait for them to kind of figure out what the new alignment looks like. Put it together, make the case, present your business case of why you think this role should exist and what value it can bring to the organization within this new structure. Um, and you just never know what can come from that. 
Yeah, I love that. So true. It really is just made up. It has room for change. It's not set in stone. And most companies change it many times. That's right. Um, okay, so please, folks, do not be shy. Questions. What are your unique, personal, general, any questions? I will take them all. Um, can I ask my former employer to help me? Letter of recommendation, connections. Can, can we ask? I like to ask, and I like to ask right in the time when things are happening. And if you get a leader who, you know, is really honest and, and I, you know, I've had experiences where the person I immediately reported to, I didn't feel like someone I could ask. And I didn't feel like they were necessarily going to represent me in the best way. And so I found the person who I felt really could. And by having that as a direct conversation, um, they got to say what they were comfortable representing me for. That's that's something I noticed. There was a discernment there. It's not just like a blanket. Yeah, no problem. We'll back you up. Some people say that. And other people are like, look, if you're going for a role in this area, 100%, here's what, you know. So it's a great conversation to have. And it might feel a little awkward to ask, but I encourage you to ask, you know, would you be willing to support me in my journey? Um, one experience I had, I really felt ill-fitted in a role. I struggled for, you know, the whole time I was in it and then decided to leave or ask for a layoff. And um, I was really nervous about what that was going to be like in terms of an exit. But showing up, I showed up fully. I did my best right until the end. And I made sure everything was taken care of and tried to prepare for as smooth a transition as possible for those who were left behind. And then had a final conversation with the CEO. And I was surprised to hear this person say, anything, is there anything we can do? And there was a whole range of things that they were willing to do to support me and to, to create a softer landing. So I highly encourage you to ask. Yeah, I love that. Just show, be willing to show up. You never know. I and actually I think have seen people um, like project committees or um, workplace committees where you've worked with people in a group over a period of time. I've also seen people ask committees for a letter of recommendation because they have an experience that might be different as well than the leader working with you. It's a collegial uh, type of a testimonial or a reference. And I thought that was a really interesting um, piece. And I actually had one client who said she went to her LinkedIn one day and there was all these beautiful recommendations from people who had worked with her, her over the years in different capacities. Um, someone that she supervised, someone that was on a project or some kind of a committee with her. And I thought that was great as well. And that was actually something she didn't request. I think people cared so deeply about her that they they just went and did that. And I thought that's a reminder for all of us as well, that we can give people recommendations and testimonials without necessarily having them to ask for it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I th and I think the other thing that you have to remember in business, that in, especially in the larger organizations, the job, the, the recommendation they'll give you, they'll direct everybody to the HR department of the head office, the head office will confirm that you work there, how long you work there, and maybe even what your last job role was, but that's all. So if you want more than that, then you do have to ask people for a personal reference, job reference from them. On the other side of that, the HR people who are interviewing know that's the job recommend, that's the recommendation they're going to get from your last employer is going to confirm that you actually work there. So your references can now be personal references or peers that you worked with or previous employers, you know, all of that sort of thing. So um, don't be put off by that. That's just the way business is done these days. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the companies don't want to be liable for something that they might have said to someone. So they just don't let anybody say anything except for the bare facts. 
So, uh, which is okay to have that kind of a, a recommendation too, because you're talking to HR professionals on either side. They'll understand how that works also. So don't be too concerned about that kind of a recommendation from your last, your, your most recent employer. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love the committee project idea because I run many projects, that's what I do for <laughs> my day job. But we usually get like, you know, like subject matter experts and people come to the team like for their growth opportunities, right? So it's really an opportunity for them to shine outside their daily roles. So there is usually something there that that committee or team or who's leading it can provide as a reference as feedback as you know glowing um highlighting the strengths that you might not get from your own manager that's really important because a lot of times people are um involved in those committees and activities as stretch as like i'm looking for something like you said that i'm not it's not part of my current job description but i'm looking to practice my leadership skills, or I'm looking to practice my, you know, and so that can be a really key resource in helping someone transition, not just to a new role, but uh, with a new organization doing the same role, but a new role in a new organization. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, it's great. Um, any other questions? Last, last minute or two here. I'll just say, um, if I may, Kelly, that um, uh, if anybody is on the call and, you know, I talk a lot about the inner stuff, so uh, feel free to connect on LinkedIn and I'll share some of the, the activities that I mentioned tonight that I think can be helpful in that transition period and just in um, collecting your thoughts about what you have to bring to the world. I have some of those that I'm happy to share as, as free resources. No, that's wonderful. Um, one question from here. Um, how do I talk about being laid off in an upcoming interview? I think we briefly touched on that earlier, that it's no longer a stigma, but any like any responses you would lead with? I, th I think what uh, Maureen, when you were sharing that earlier, uh, how you framed that was really important. And sometimes we get nervous about, in a, I mean, about an interview, but nervous about something that that's sensitive or even somewhat raw for us. And one of the best tips I can offer is to practice how you would answer that question. You can even role play it with someone that you trust, but practice what I like to do is actually talk to the mirror and, and pretend that the mirror was the person that I was in real conversation with. So that it's not only, um, Lan, you said earlier about the importance of it's not just what we say, but it's how we say it non-verbally. And this is an example of where that skill you talked about is very important because we could say, this is what happened. My position was found to be redundant, but how we appear when we say it might feel different than the words that are coming across. Um, and and we, we build confidence by practice. And so I always say to people, if ever you have to share something that's difficult, awkward, uncomfortable, kind of makes your gut go, I don't like talk about this, then that's when we got to practice. And so write down what you want to say on a piece of paper, go in and find a mirror and talk to yourself at least <laughs> 10 times. Because what you will see is every time you practice it, your shoulders start to sink. You're not like this anymore. You're kind of relaxing into the conversation. And in the interview, if you forget what you were going to say, which happens to the best of us in stressful times, your brain kind of goes, hmm, I know it's in there somewhere. I know it's in there somewhere. Oh, there it is, because you practiced it so many times. And what it allows you to do is speak with confidence and yeah. with clarity when you share that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, we're at time now. Any other closing, very quick last minute thoughts? We've covered a lot. I'm going to dream of um, clouds and clay for my. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's just it's, that one's new to me and I love it. So. That literally came on a, on a walk yesterday. And yeah. so I'm just, yeah. you know, there is, the, we got to allow that creative space, allow that creative space. Uh, just on the, the being able to speak to it in an interview, this is why I talk about owning your story being so powerful and important. Uh, if you carry a stigma around being laid off, that's what ends up being communicated. So the last time I was laid off, and I have been laid off several times, the last time I was laid off was because I had a dream to create a world-class professional services organization. And what the investors wanted for the organization was that we actually create more of a self-serve uh, service organization. We came to a fork in the road in terms of the vision for the organization. That's how I talk about that layoff. <laughs> and then there's other pieces that I can add to it. So that's true. That is true. And that, that's why I'm saying your narrative about your experiences is what's the most powerful. Not the experience itself, but how you make sense of it. And then how you then communicate that through your narrative and through your body language. And I certainly wanted, I know Kelly's going to do this also. Thank you both, Charmaine and Alain because we really feel that this was a relevant topic and timely because it's all around us, right? Uh, when we wanted to have the opportunity to share with the Women in Leadership Foundation audience that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train coming your way, that there yeah. you can get through this. Um, and we loved your suggestion about the conversational way format that we did this this event tonight. So kudos to both of you for coming up with that suggestion, which Kelly and I loved. Um, and we'll, we're going to probably borrow this more than once. So thank you so much, not only for your insights, your experience and sharing, but for the, the whole event. We really mm -hmm. do appreciate everything you brought to us. Thank you so much. You. I'll, I'll just end on, you know, if you're watching this later on the recording, like, just know you're not alone. We've, we've lived it ourselves. We've been through it from different perspectives and something really beautiful can come out the other side. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so great. We do have one last question. If we can mm. do it super quick. Um, how do you gain the courage to move past a downgrade downsizing and apply to a new job elsewhere? Call me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's talk. Uh, it, it really, you really do have to come from the inside out. Yeah. If it's shaken your confidence or identity, there's no quick way to just paper over that duct. I mean, you can do it. Sometimes out of necessity, you got to just, you know, shoulder on. Um, but it's not the best way. And so some of what I did working with an organization recently, people went through a transition. There was no sponsorship for folks leaving to get coaching. I just reached out to them and said, I'm here, I'm available. Let's have some sessions. There's no cost to you. Um, so uh, that is something that is, I have the privilege and the luxury to be able to do in my career. So if, if you're struggling and if you're feeling alone in this, just reach out. Uh, I'm happy to have a conversation and to help you get back to that place where you're like, all oh, right, yes, that's who I am. <laughs> Let's go. Right. Oh, no, that's amazing. Uh, yes, I very much enjoyed this conversation. Very timely. So much to take in. Um, if anyone had to jump in or out, please, the recording uh, will be posted like on the Will YouTube probably tomorrow. You know, catch up watch what you missed. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at the next event. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. I hope to see you again at another event. Um, always so amazing insights and different insights every time we've covered a few topics. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you for lending us your very valuable time. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, Charmaine, <laughs> Kelly. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. And thank you to those who tuned in. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And we have some thank yous coming in. So many nuggets to take away. Absolutely. I feel the same. Have a, have a great evening, everyone. And you as well. Thank you.